Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the University of Michigan Department of Physics and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible by Pfizer Incorporated. this situation, I'm at home and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to talk about today because I haven't given this particular talk before. So I'm discussing it with my wife and I suggest I'm going to talk about food, eating food and what foods you should buy when you're in the market. And she turned to me and she immediately said, you can't talk about that. You're not a nutrition expert. You don't know anything about nutrition. You're a biologist. Why don't you talk about biology? So I thought about it. And I have to say, and don't anyone tell her I said this, she was right. <laughs> I'm not a nutrition expert. And I told her that I would tell you that right up front. Okay, so I am not a nutrition expert. I'm curious, is anyone in the audience today a nutrition expert? <laughs> Raise your hand if you are an expert in nutrition. <clears throat> All right, I'm pretty safe then. Good. <laughs> she also suggested that maybe I should tell people about how much I love to go to the supermarket and shop. And I might share some of my obsession with reading food labels with you. Now, she probably wasn't serious about that, but I thought that was a great idea. So part of what I'm going to do today is, in fact, share that obsession with you. Now, is that an important thing to do? Well, I think it is, because you can hardly go by a day right now without hearing something about low-carb diet, or cholesterol, or butter versus margarine, or the new USDA guidelines on foods or trans fats. And my wife's comment about me not being an expert in nutrition actually made me realize something. For most of us, we're not going to have an expert in nutrition with us when we're in the market. So that means you have to know some of this information yourself if you want to make informed decisions. And it turns out that with just a little bit of information about biology, you can be a scientifically literate shopper. So that's sort of what we're about today. So I decided we wanted to have some fun, and we also wanted to do some learning. So in order for us to learn, this has to be partly an interactive experience. There's only one of me today, but there's this whole audience of you. So if you want to catch my attention, you're not only going to have to raise your hand, but you're going to have to possibly shout something out, like stop or question. So just to be sure that you understood those rules. I want you to humor me for the next five seconds. Pretend that you wanted to Stop. either ask a question, <laughs> not yet, <laughs> or you had a good comment to share with us. So on the count of three, you like everybody to just raise your hand and shout out, Stop. Okay. One, two, three, Stop. <laughs> fantastic group, fantastic group. Okay. Now there are three main types of foods, as I'm sure you know sugars, fats, and proteins. And I want to try to talk about a little of them today. And the first group I want to talk about are sugars, or more generally, you can say carbohydrates. Now, I first want to give you a little group assignment. What I'd like you to do is form your groups again, and just think of some carbohydrates that you encounter in your everyday lives. Now remember, when you're giving answers here, these are group answers, because you've been discussing this in your group. So if we don't like your answer, you just blame it on your group. Okay? <laughs> so feel free to respond. So does someone have a group answer like to share? Yes. Beer. Beer. That's an interesting first answer for a <laughs> Saturday morning. Okay, there are some carbohydrates in beer. Yes. Bread. Bread, definitely carbohydrate. Some other ones. Potatoes. Potatoes, full of carbohydrates. What else? 
pasta, donuts. rice, donuts, bagels. bagels, sugars. Okay, so a lot of things you've mentioned, all food items. What about most fruits and vegetables are carbohydrates. If you're wearing a cotton shirt, cotton's a carbohydrate. Paper, carbohydrate. Wood is carbohydrate. Well, termites eat wood, but we don't. So there are carbohydrates all around you. You're eating them, you may be wearing them, writing on them, writing with them. Pencil is mostly carbohydrate. So it's important to know about carbohydrates, a lot of them in our everyday lives. So here's a common one that you might see, table sugar. So what is table sugar? It's sucrose. Okay, but knowing it's sucrose doesn't tell us that much. So let's take a look at the structure of a common carbohydrate. Now before I show you that, I just want you to think about the name for a second. Carbohydrate, or hydrate of carbon, hydrate or water. So in fact, most carbohydrates have the chemical formula of CH2O. And some number of those units, such as six, so C6, H12O6 is a common carbohydrate. And what I'm showing you here is the structure of glucose, which is also called dextrose. Now one thing I want to point out is the ending OSE. So most carbohydrates end with those three letters. So if you see those letters, you automatically know it's a carbohydrate. Glucose or dextrose is called a monosaccharide because there's one of those units. It's a hexagonal ring structure with five carbons in the ring and one more sticking out of the ring. So we can easily draw it then as just this sort of simple structure. So glucose, as I said, is a monosaccharide, and here are some other monosaccharides, fructose and also galactose. Now, just to be honest with you, fructose doesn't look exactly like that, but for our purposes today, it doesn't matter. You can join monosaccharides together to form a di or two saccharide. So sucrose turns out to be a disaccharide, and it's composed of glucose and fructose. You can also form more than, join more than two of these together into long chains, and we'll talk a little bit about, about that later. Lactose is another example of a disaccharide composed of two different ones, a glucose and, a, in this case, a galactose. So that's all I want to say about the structure of carbohydrates. Now let's talk a little bit about practical information. So Nutrigrain bars. This is a breakfast item, right? Because it says right here, Cereal bars with wheat, whole grain oats, and fruit. So it must be good for you. What about this one? This is another breakfast item. Pop-Tarts. My question to you is how much sugar do Pop-Tarts contain? Now I need to point out again, remember I said I'm not a nutritionist. So I'm not going to tell you today whether or not you should eat something like Pop-Tarts. I want you to be able to make that decision for yourselves. So let's take a look at the ingredients on Pop-Tarts. <laughs> what I'd like you to do, decide which of those items are carbohydrates. Okay? Okay. So which of those are Pop-Tarts? I'm just going to go through them one at a time and just shout out yes or no if it's a Pop-Tart. It's the whole audience response here. Okay, how about the corn syrup? Yeah. Yes. Dextrose, we have an OSE. High fructose corn syrup. Yes. Cracker meal. Yes. Modified wheat starch. Yes. How about soybean oil? No. no. Sugar. Yes. Raspberries. Yes. Yep. Dried apples. Yes. Yeah, citric acid flavors. Uh, enriched wheat flour. Yes. Sugar. Yes. Soybean or cottonseed oil. No. Corn syrup. Yes. Dextrose. Yes. Salt, no, but high fructose corn syrup, yes. corn cereal, yes. modified cornstarch. Yes. <laughs> so, quite a few carbohydrates in the old Pop Tarts. This is my favorite flavor, the apple cinnamon. So, again, I'm not saying whether or not you should eat them, but next time you pick up a box, you might want to take a look at the ingredients and just see 
how good they are for you. For example, consider this situation. You haven't had time to go to the market. You wake up and you've got to get breakfast ready for you or for your children. And you look in the cupboard and all you have are these three items. Pop-Tarts that we just talked about, item A or item B. Which of these items you would choose for breakfast? So raise your hand if your group decided you would choose Pop-Tarts for your breakfast item. Okay, there are a few honest answers, good. Okay, how many groups decided they would choose item A? A lot of people chose item A. All right, anybody choose item B? Fair number, looks like most of you chose item A. But we know that, again, the top one is Pop-Tarts. Let's see what item B is. Item B <laughs> is the uh, Kit Kat. Now, I'm not telling you whether that's a good breakfast item or not. That's up to you. But most of you did choose item A. So let's see what item A is. Item A. <laughs> So a lot of you thought that it'd be good to serve your children Little Debbie's Powdered Donuts for breakfast. My wife won't let me eat those. I, maybe I should come and live at your house. Go on. Okay, I think we need to try something else. Let's try one more of these. Which of these items, then, do you think has the most sugar? The Snickers Cruncher Bar, the Nutrigrain Yogurt Bar Cereal Bar, low-fat version, or the Dannon peach low-fat yogurt, 99% fat-free. Okay, let's see what the answers are for this. Raise your hand if your group said that Snickers has the most sugar. A few of you. How many of you thought the Nutrigain low-fat cereal bar? How many of you thought the yogurt? Okay. Snickers bar has 25 grams of sugar. Yogurt bar, 27 grams of sugar. Yogurt, 44 grams of sugar. Now, I eat a lot of yogurt, so again, clearly I'm not saying that this is something you shouldn't be eating, but I would think you'd want to be aware if you're trying to have a balanced diet with a certain amount of sugar, a certain amount of protein, a certain amount of fat, you want to be aware of how much sugar is in some of these items, such as yogurt. Carbohydrates react, oh, question, yes. Does plain yogurt have the sugar So it's a good question, what about plain yogurt? Plain yogurt, I don't know the actual amount, and that'd be a good thing to look at, but it definitely has less sugar, which is why it tastes terrible. I mean, it, 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 uh, but but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's better for you. Plain has 12 grams, so a lot less than these flavored ones. So carbohydrates react with taste buds on our tongues to produce the sensation of sweetness, and most people like that. And production of sweeteners is a big business. Now sucrose, or table sugar, comes from sugar cane or sugar beet, and it's pretty inexpensive. But if you're a manufacturer of ice cream or candy bars or soft drinks, you want the cheapest possible sweetener you can get so you can maximize your profit. And that's not from sugar cane or sugar beet, that's something else like sugars from corn. So a lot of vegetables have carbohydrates in a storage form that's called starch. Like potato, someone mentioned carbohydrate. Potatoes, we say, are starchy. Now the problem is that starch itself isn't that sweet. So starch is simply a group of glucoses linked together. And if you break those down, they now become sweet tasting to us. So that's what these manufacturers do. They take corn, and they get out the starch, and then they break it down into the monomers, the monosaccharides, and that's what corn syrup is. Now it turns out that glucose is sweet, but fructose, another monosaccharide that I mentioned, is even sweeter. And so if those manufacturers convert some of that corn syrup to fructose, in fact, about 55% of it, they produce high fructose corn syrup, which is even sweeter, so they can use less of it and make more money. Now, there's nothing wrong with high fructose corn syrup. The problem is we're consuming so much of it as a nation that we're becoming obese. 
but you'll typically see high fructose corn syrup or corn syrup as one of the top ingredients in a lot of items for those reasons, because they're inexpensive to make. Now, there are artificial sweeteners, such as aspartame, NutraSweet, and saccharin, and others, that are not metabolized by your body, so they don't give you any calories. Now, there may be other problems associated with those, but I don't have time to talk about them today. I do want to talk a little bit about another natural sweetener, and that's honey. So my question to you, to the groups, is whether there is a difference between honey and table sugar. No. So I'm going to ask you to discuss <laughs> in your groups whether you think honey is better than sucrose, whether sucrose is better than honey, or whether they're the same. OK. Raise your hand if your group said that honey is better for you than table sugar. Raise your hand if your group said that table sugar is better for you than honey. OK. Any groups say that they're more or less the same? OK. Well, what if I told you that sucrose, as I mentioned, is a disaccharide composed of glucose linked to fructose, and honey is produced by bees. They collect nectar, and that nectar is made of sucrose and the monosaccharides, glucose and fructose, and then they break the sucrose down into the monosaccharides. So honey is basically glucose plus fructose monosaccharides. So chemically, there's not much difference between honey and sucrose. Now, who can you turn to to get this information? For example, could you turn to the trusted newspaper? <laughs> Here's a little bit of an article from the San Francisco Chronicle where the reporter says, whether it's white sugar or honey, your cells read it all as sucrose. Wrong, 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 wrong. Honey is monosaccharides. And that turns out to be important, because even though there isn't a great chemical difference between honey and sucrose, there's an important dental advantage to honey. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I want to divert a little bit into this topic of dental products because there are a lot of those in the supermarket now. You see, for example, a lot of chewing gum that says it's sort of dental friendly. So it's sugar free. And well, this one's from Arm & Hammer, so of course it has baking soda in it. But even ones that aren't from Arm & Hammer have baking soda. This one, look at this. This is Echo Dent. Natural. This is from Whole Foods, so it's got to be Echo Dent. <laughs> and it fights plaque. And look at this one, biotin dry mouth gum. Contains natural salivary enzymes. Mmm, that sound good. How about Aquafresh? This one helps neutralize plaque acids. Well, what's that about? If you turn this over, this is what's on the back. Look at this, it's got this graph here. It says pH value after eating, risk of tooth decay, the danger zone. You might pick this up in the market you might look at it, and you wouldn't want to be befuddled. You'd want to say, ah, yes, I understand exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> You'll see ads for things like this, plaques. Is this something that you want to spend your money on? Is it going to do anything for you? Well, I don't like to rely on advertisers to tell me what decisions I want to make in the market. There's also a lot of different types of toothpaste. It's an amazing this shelf full of toothpaste. Here's one for enamel on. It says it replaces lost minerals. Again, what is that referring to? In fact, on the subject of toothpaste, which is a fascinating one, I suspect many of you have wondered what's in toothpaste. You're putting this in your mouth, most of us at least a couple times a day, brushing on your teeth, getting on your tongues and your cheeks. Some of it you might even swallow. And I know you've wondered what's in it. Or if not, here's a good opportunity to do so. Think about what the ingredients are in toothpaste. OK, I'd love to let you keep on discussing it, but I've got to stay on track here. So I need to hear some group responses to what items you think are in toothpaste. Yes? Seaweed. seaweed. And why do you think seaweed's in there? Carrageenan. For what purpose? Uh, binder. Binder, OK, good. Abrasive. Abrasive. Got to scrub the stuff off those teeth, absolutely. 
Sugar. Sugar. Why would you have sugar in there? <laughs> Tastes good. <laughs> okay. CMC. CMC. Carboxymethylcellulose. Carboxymethylcellulose. For what purpose? It's, uh, it makes it jelly. So another body, uh, give us some body. <laughs> yes, up there. Fluoride. Fluoride. That's a good one. Fluoride. As far as I understand, is one of the best inventions, or not really inventions, but of the best things we've discovered for tooth health. Chalk. Chalk is an, another kind of abrasive. Whitener. That's right. We want our teeth to be nice and bright. Now, you've missed the prime ingredient in most, if not all, toothpastes. What's, well, there is detergent, but what's the number one ingredient? What's the cheapest thing you can package and sell? Water. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> got to have water in there. That's can't get cheaper than that. But you got a lot of the other ingredients, fluoride, abrasives, things to give it body. You put detergent in there. Why? How do you know if it's doing what it's supposed to do unless your mouth just foams all up and it's you know, <laughs> leaking out? And that's what it's all about. But because that detergent tastes so bad, you got to have sweeteners. You got to have some flavoring. So toothpaste. That's your. This is uh, Crest, my my favorite. There are also a lot of toothbrushes on the market. I mean, a huge array. And my question is, why is it so important to brush and floss your teeth? So important that in fact, you might even have to brush on the go. <laughs> oh yeah, chew and brush. These little. Disposable toothbrushes you can buy. You just open up the package, stick in your mouth, and chew it, and then throw it away. It's kind of got a little bit of sort of toothpaste, <clears throat> excuse me, on it. So it's it's a you know traveling toothbrush, chew, chew and brush. And, you know, and this reminds me of something I really have to say that in order to bring this talk to you, I had to sample <laughs> all of these items, okay? Because I wasn't going to talk about it unless I knew something about it. So I hope you appreciate that, you know. <laughs> The Snickers Cruncher and so on. This, you know, this is a scientific talk. I had to experiment. Petrodex for your pet, toothbrushing. My dog does not uh, <clears throat> as crazy about it as I wish, but at least it's poultry flavored, so she's kind of catching on. <laughs> so why is it so important to brush, even on the road? Got to get rid of that plaque. So what is plaque? Here's a couple pictures of plaque. The plaque is a bacterial colony. Here is the surface of your tooth. So your tooth is down here. And I'm not talking about a single layer of bacteria. I'm talking about a layer, maybe 100 bacteria deep. Now, this is probably not from one day's growth. This could be several days or even a couple weeks. I'm not sure. And this is just a scanning electron micrograph, so you can see it a little more close up. But you've got, if you don't brush your teeth, these bacteria are growing thick on your teeth. That's plaque. Well, what's the problem with plaque? Now, it's natural to have bacteria in your mouth. They're there all the time. So here's the back of this Aquafresh box again. And I just put this graph in a little different form here. So in this graph, we're looking at pH on the y-axis, less acidic and more acidic, and then time after eating a meal. So what happens is when you eat, especially a sugar, not only are you trying to get the nutrients, but the bacteria in your mouth want their fair share, too. So they're grabbing those sugars, and they're breaking them down. And one of the products, some of the products are acidic in nature. So they increase the acid content around your tooth. So within the first 20 minutes, the acidity around the tooth increases dramatically. And when it gets below a pH of about 5.5, this is that danger zone. What happens is your teeth start to lose minerals. Your teeth contain calcium and and phosphate and magnesium, and the low pH causes them to diffuse out. This is like if you ever have hard water deposits on a faucet, you can remove them with a little bit of vinegar, which is 5% acetic acid. Same thing is happening in your teeth. Now, this is a natural occurrence. It happens all the time. And then when you stop eating, the teeth start to remineralize because your saliva is full of these same minerals, and so it forces them back into the tooth. And then you eat again, and it drops down, and then it goes back up, and so on. The problem occurs when you snack a lot throughout the day. Snacking, I hate to tell you, is terrible for your teeth. 
because the pH drops rapidly, and then it takes a while to go back up. And then if you eat again, right here, it drops down before it remineralizes. And it starts to go up and down again. And it can never reach that sort of resting point. So for, just for your teeth, it'd be best to eat, well, I guess one meal a day. But <laughs> three meals a day without snacks would be the best thing for your teeth. Now, the problem with the plaque is the more bacteria there, the more acids they're producing. And they also make it harder for the saliva to contact the tooth. So it's harder for the resting pH to be achieved. So it's important to get rid of that plaque. And here's an example from the rest of that enamel on ad of a tooth after demineralization. And then here they say after treatment with enamel on, it's remineralized. I don't know if enamel on does that. I'm not promoting enamel on. Here's another example of the demineralized tooth. For example, if you drink a lot of soft drinks, terrible for your teeth. The soft drinks are low pH to begin with, sort of acidic, and they have a lot of usually high fructose corn syrup. And so those bacteria love it. And in particular, when we drink soft drinks, we tend to sip them. A little sip, pH crashes. A little sip, it's down still. More stays down there. Your teeth just cannot recover from that. So you might want to be aware of the types of foods you're eating. Of course, some are better than others, like apples and peanuts, and in terms of your teeth, and also whether they're complex carbohydrates or simple sugars. Simple sugars, those bacteria just love them. Now, remember, we started this little diversion by talking about honey. And I said there's a dental advantage to honey. So what's that advantage? One of the bacteria in your mouth is called Streptococcus mutans. And it turns out that this bacteria can use sucrose, the disaccharide, but not the monosaccharides, fructose and glucose, to make a substance called glucan, which is basically an adhesive. So this glucan helps the bacteria adhere to your tooth, especially the sides of your tooth, which are smooth and sort of hard to grab onto in comparison to the top, which is very rough and fissured. So when you're eating sucrose, these streptococcus mutans are going to town, making this glucan, spreading it to the sides of your teeth where they can cause decay on the side, the smooth surfaces. So there is this dental advantage to honey. Now, one more thing about labels. You can see my true obsession here. Has anyone noticed this type of warning on honey? Do not feed to infants under one year of age. Right there on the jar, kind of in small print, but it is there. If you're obsessed, you'll see it. Does anybody know why that warning is on there? Food allergy, not the reason that this warning is on there. Uh, no, it's a good guess, but not, not a, a reaction to that. There's bacteria. Bacteria. So remember, honey is collected, is made by bees, collected in the wild. There may be bacteria in the honey. In particular, there may be spores from bacteria. Some bacteria can form spores, which are extremely resistant. And in particular, one that we're worried about is from the bacterium called Clostridium, botulinum. This bacteria, can, uh, spores, can be in the honey. And it turns out that those spores cannot germinate in the intestines of adults. But they can germinate in the intestines of infants. If they do, they can produce a toxin that can lead to botulism. So it's a neurotoxin. So you never want to feed honey to infants under one year of age. It would be very dangerous. OK, a few more things on carbohydrates. This is a milk I used to get all the time. I can't find it here. It's got acidophilus plus bifidus bacteria. Why would you put that in your milk? It says right on the back here why you should drink it, even if you can't say it. You also see products like this that are lactose free. Or you can see milk that is lactose reduced. And if you look at the ingredients, it has the enzyme lactase. Raise your hand if you or someone you know is lactose intolerant. Fair number of people. Well, what's happening is that turns out our intestines cannot absorb lactose. So infants secrete the enzyme lactase. They break down the lactose, which remember is a disaccharide, into the monosaccharides. And then we can absorb the monosaccharides. Most adults don't make a lot of lactase. 
If you're lactose intolerant, what's happening is you don't make the lactase, and you can't absorb the lactose. And even though you can't, bacteria, which are not just in your mouth, but all through your intestinal tract, they're going to take up that lactose. They're going to break it down. They're going to produce some gas byproducts. And that leads to indigestion and possibly diarrhea. And it could be quite severe, actually. People who are lactose intolerant not only can't drink milk, but typically can't eat ice cream or cheese, dairy products like that. So that's why there are milks that are soy milk or rice milk or lactose-reduced milk. You can take a pill that is purified lactase before you eat those products, and you'll feel fine. OK, I want to start to talk a bit about lipids, which is the scientific name for fats. And I want to transition into that by looking at a couple of ads. So here is an ad for Jell-O, and it says the O in Jell-O-free stands for zero grams of fat. Is that great? Or how about this one? Start your day with the natural fat-free goodness of Smucker's. My question is whether it's meaningful to say that a preserve are fat-free. Is that really useful information? Here are three recipes for preserves from the joy of cooking. Strawberry, peach, and raspberry currant preserves. What's the common ingredient in preserves? Sugar. Lots and lots of sugar. So it's sort of meaningful, a meaningless, in my opinion, to say that preserves, for example, don't have a lot of, of, a lot of fat. It's like saying that this apple is good for you because it doesn't have any orange. <laughs> you cannot compare apples to oranges. That's the same thing as comparing carbohydrates to lipids. Let me show you the structure of one type of lipid, a fat, a storage fat, a triglyceride. This is called a triglyceride because it has three of these units. I just abbreviated these linked to this molecule. This was a glycerol, three carbon units. And this part is called a fatty acid. It's called an acid because this part used to be an acidic group, carboxylic acid group. And this part is fatty. It's just a series of carbons bonded to hydrogens, hydrocarbons, like gasoline, for example. You know, gas floats on water. It's not soluble. Butter's not soluble in water. So it's a fatty acid. There are different types of fatty acids. For example, I'll show you some here. So in some of these, carbons are linked only to hydrogens. Carbons will form four bonds. So for example, this one is bonded to a carbon, a carbon, and then two hydrogens. If all the carbons in this chain are bonded to two hydrogens, it's called saturated. If a carbon is double bonded to another carbon, so that they're each bonded to only one hydrogen, it's called unsaturated. And if two or more are double bonded to carbons, it's called polyunsaturated. So when you're hearing about saturated or unsaturated fats, that's all we're talking about, double bonds in these fatty acid chains. One more point about structure. If the hydrogens on these carbons that have a double bond are on the same side of the chain, it's called cis. And if the hydrogens are on opposite sides of the chain, it's called trans. So a trans fat is simply one in which these hydrogens are on opposite sides of the chain. That's all it means. Now, one of the ways in which trans fats are made is by taking big vats of fat and bubbling through hydrogen with a catalyst, a metal catalyst. And in that process, you end up with trans fats. So anytime you see the words hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oil, another name for that is trans fat. Okay, so that's all I want to say about the structures of fats. Now, you'll see a lot of ads and things. I mean, here's a crazy one for some kind of drug that will turn fat into water. Now, if you know anything about the structures of fats, you know that that probably doesn't make a lot of sense. You'll also see more reasonable ads for things like butter alternatives. But look at this. I mean, it talks about, it's hard to read here, but cholesterol, saturated fat, lactose. So you have to know a little bit about these things in order to know if they're good for you, if you want to use them. Question, yes. Um, are there any advantages or disadvantages of cis or trans, or are they the same? I mean, Good question, important question. Are there advantages or disadvantages to cis or trans? It turns out that the problem with some of these fats is that they bind proteins in your, in your cells. So trans fat, it turns out, for some reason, is even better at binding these proteins, in particular a transcription factor, a protein that goes into the nucleus of the cell and tells the cell to make more fat. 
in particular in your liver. And so when you eat trans fats, it tends to cause a greater fat production in your body. Higher levels of fat can lead to atherosclerosis, hardening of the artery, arteries. Heart disease is the main killer of people in this country. We can talk more about that in the answer and question period, a very important question. Okay, here's a little bit of an article from last week from the New York Times, just read part of this. Nutritionists wonder whether consumers know enough to distinguish good fat from bad, natural oils from artificial. I don't know that they will look at a label that has low trans fat and high saturated fat and be able to figure out if it is healthy or not. And consumers might not even care. And of course, that's not true for the people here today because that's why you're here, you care. Okay, look at this item. Does this have trans fat? Yes, it does. Hydrogenated vegetable oil, trans fat. But look at the nutrition facts from that same item. Trans fat, zero grams. What's going on? Question? Comment? But look at the total fat, 1.5 grams. Saturated fat, one, zero, zero, zero. Where's the half gram? Trans fat, less than a gram per serving size. You don't have to list it. So you've got to be careful when you're looking at these labels. Now they're going to start listing trans fats, but even if it lists it here, it says there isn't any, you know better because you looked at the ingredients and you saw that there was trans fat. Okay, the eternal question. Which is better for you, butter or margarine? Butter. Hold on. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna give you three choices. I'm gonna ask you whether butter is better, whether margarine is better, or whether you think they're the same. So how many groups said that butter is better for you? How many of you said that margarine was better for you? How many of you thought they were about the same? Okay, those who said butter was better, I'm curious, what are the reasons you think butter is better? <laughs> Hydrogenated, okay. Any other reasons butter is better for you? So it's a more natural product. Okay, well, that's interesting. So if we, oh, one thing I want to note here, I just think this is really cute. So it says that, of course, there's no cholesterol in margarine. Not only is there no cholesterol, again, it might be hard to read this, but it says here, contains 100% less cholesterol than butter. <laughs> in fact, I've determined it contains 200% less than butter. <laughs> Boy, this, this guy's gotta get paid for doing something, these advertisers. Okay, let's look at the back of these products. So in fact, butter does have cholesterol, it's an animal product, but only 30 milligrams. And margarine is truly cholesterol free. But let's look at the total fat, 11 grams in butter, 11 grams in margarine. Saturated fat is also important, butter has 7 grams, margarine only 2 grams. But as someone mentioned, margarine does have trans fat. Now I can't actually tell you which is better, I don't think anyone knows right now, whether one is truly better for you than the other. But you can make a decision for yourself, weighing all these facts. Very good point. That serving size and the amount that we're consuming is, of course, a critical part of all this. One little pad of butter or margarine is probably not going to do you much harm but a big stick of it for breakfast, for example, <laughs> would not be good. That's a, that is very important. And that's true for all of these things. Serving size is critical, absolutely. Is it different in terms of... Um, I don't think there's much of a difference in terms of how well they can break those down, but I'm actually not sure about that, the double versus single bonds. That's an uh, interesting question. How, how, do you, how, how, does, how do they know that hydrogenation makes a, the, the uh, trans form and not the cis form? Interesting question. How do we know hydrogenation makes the trans form and not the cis form? 
The cis fatty acids are what tend to be found in nature. So if scientists look chemically, however they do that, don't ask me, I'm a biologist, not a chemist, they see that they're cis. When they do this artificial bubbling through and look at what they get, they find this usually the trans form. Why? I don't know. It's an interesting question. If you look at peanut butters, not the ones that are natural, but ones such as Skippy or Jif, they don't say no added stabilizers. What's a stabilizer in peanut butter? What's the problem, the number one problem with natural peanut butter? Separates. Separates, right. You want an emulsifier. So it turns out scientists found that if you partially hydrogenate the oils in peanut butter, you prevent them from separating. So most commercial brands of peanut butter, such as Skippy or Jif, will say partially hydrogenated vegetable oil. Now, again, I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't eat them. I eat Skippy all the time. Delicious. The other problem with these natural ones is they're not sweet enough. <laughs> so you've got to add sugar. Not necessarily, but you might want to do it. You'll see a lot of items that say no trans fat. Now, does that mean this is good for you? Well, not necessarily. You've got to look at all the ingredients. It's better than having trans fat, but of course this has probably a lot of carbohydrate in it, and other fats which aren't necessarily good for you. So look at all the ingredients. So if you're trying to cut down on your carbohydrates and your fats, what are you left with? Protein. protein. So let's take a look at the structure of protein. All proteins are made of amino acids. It's called an amino acid because there's an amino group on one side and an acid group on the other, linked to this central carbon, which is also bonded to a hydrogen and then to what we call an R group. This is just an abbreviation. There are 20 commonly found amino acids, and they differ in the R group, the chemical structure. So leucine has a different R group than lysine, which has a different R group than aspartic acid, and so on. But that's the basic structure of the amino acid. And all proteins, no matter what they're from, plants, animals, bacteria, yeast, they're all made of amino acids. Source doesn't matter. But look at this warning. Smart shoppers learn to read food labels, looking not only for milk and lactose, but also for such words as whey, curds, milk byproducts, dry milk solids, non-fat dry milk powder, because if those are on the label, the product contains lactose. And it turns out that a lot of protein bars are made from milk or sometimes soy protein. So this one, for example, the best tasting bar, is made from whey protein. So I wanted you to, to note that in case you're lactose intolerant, you have to be aware of that. But there's another point I wanted to make from this kind of bar. This is not only made from whey protein, but it's made from the advanced whey protein formula. <laughs> so the question is, how much is it worth? Again, whey protein is made of amino acids, as is soy protein, as is any other kind of protein. When it gets in your stomach and it's being broken down, it's pretty much an amino acid. I'm not saying whether this is worth buying or not. I'm just saying that I want you to be aware of these words. Here's another bar. In this case, the power bar, Protein Plus. So my question is, are these bars, and there are so many of them, are they good for you? This has 24 grams of protein. That's a pretty good chunk. That's about, I think, 30% of your US RDA or daily value. What does the plus stand for? One thing is a chunk of carbohydrates, 38 grams in that one versus 24 grams of protein. Good chunk of carbohydrates. And also, look at these proteins. Whey protein, caseinate, which is milk, whey, nonfat dry milk, powder, you know there's lactose in here, plus these carbohydrates. So again, you have to be aware of what these items contain. Absolutely, carbohydrates are fuel. And again, I'm not saying whether these things are good or bad for you, just that if you're trying to balance your diet, if you think you're picking up a protein bar, you might want to think twice. You're picking up a protein plus carbohydrate bar. That's not necessarily bad. If you're going to go and exercise a lot, that may be just the thing you need. So it's not a matter of saying these are good or bad for you, but just be aware of what they are. Okay, so I've got to start to wrap up. Here is another bit of an article from uh, earlier this year. 
And it says here, it's up to you as a consumer to know what a low fat food is, what a high sugar food is, the difference between whole grains and refined ones, and which foods are low in trans fats, cholesterol, salt, and sugar. And unless you can parse the food label, which means break it down into its individual components, which most people cannot do, it's very difficult. So, I want to see how much you've been paying attention and how much you've learned today. <laughs> I'm going to give you some items, and don't shout out if you think you know what they are. Discuss in your groups if you can figure out what these items are. I'm going to start you off with a simple one, build up your confidence. Okay, remember, don't shout this out. Okay. Any group think they have the answer to this? Peanut butter. Raise your hand if your group agrees with that answer. Okay, you guys think you're smart? <laughs> what brand? <laughs> That's my favorite. That's right. Skippy. <laughs> Extra crunchy, super chunk. You can see where I've been scraping away at the bottom of it here to get out every last bit. Okay, let's see if you've really been paying attention. What is this item? Do we think we have an answer? Say that again, please. Crunchy Snickers. Oh, that's a good guess. Not correct this, in this case, but... Brownie mix. That's a good guess. Not, that's a good guess, but it's not this particular item. Cocoa Pebbles. Cocoa Pebbles. <laughs> Cocoa Pebbles are a lot better than you might think. <laughs> not Cocoa Pebbles. Any other guesses? Uh, hot chocolate mix. Hot chocolate mix. Interesting, because it's got uh, cocoa, I think, in there. Yeah, not hot chocolate mix, though. What can you make out of some flour, sugar, a little bit of eggs, and then fry it up in some shortening? As you said, in this case, an Entenmann's rich frosted donut. Yeah, that one's hard to tell. We had a lot of good guesses there. Question? As far as I know, the first item is still the uh, number, the uh, most in abundance in that product. So that's why donuts are indeed so tasty. <laughs> They're high in fat. They have that good mouth feel when you eat them. Probably not the best thing for you, but they're good. Okay, how about this one? Okay. We have an answer up here. Good guess, Appleson and Pop-Tarts, but not, these are much better for you, I think, than Appleson and Pop-Tarts. You were thinking oatmeal? Oatmeal, good, good try, not quite. Apple Jacks, very good guess, very close, very close. Breakfast bars. Breakfast bars, no, we're very close with Apple Jacks, not quite Apple Jacks, but here we have the Apple, cinnamon, oat, there we go. Apple, cinnamon, Cheerios, with a little bit of sweetener. Apple, cinnamon, Cheerios. Okay, here's another, uh, another confidence booster. Don't shout it out. I think you'll know this. That is correct, that is a giveaway. Okay, what is this one? Yogurt, I had to erase the yogurt from here. <laughs> Thought it might kind of give it away. But I probably put this up there to remind you, if you didn't realize, that yogurt has the same bacteria that you find, for example, in this milk, lactobacillus acidophilus. People who are lactose intolerant can typically eat yogurt because they have added these bacteria, which you can also get in just in a supplement form, because they will break down that lactose for you if you can't produce your own lactase. Okay, one more, that was the Dan and low-fat peach yogurt. One more question for your groups. I'll give you a hint, these are related items. 
generally similar to each other. Okay, just to keep on time, I have to see if we have any answers. Anyone know what these are? Power bars, type of bars, look at this one. High fructose corn syrup, sugar, corn syrup. Top three ingredients. These are Tiger's Milk Nutrition Bar and an Energy Bar. Yeah, you put that much sugar in something, it's gonna give you energy, you'll be bouncing <laughs> off the walls. I mean, oh. Yeah, I'm not saying it's bad for you. You have to make that decision for yourself. Okay, take home exercise. Next time you're in a store with some food, pick up the label, see how well you can parse it. How much sugar is in there? Does it have trans fats? What's the type of protein? So that you can make a decision of whether it's worth the money and whether you really want to eat it. <laughs> Hopefully from our discussion today, you feel confident to now go through the supermarket, tackle those aisles, make those decisions, because you are now food literate. <laughs> Thank you. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the University of Michigan Department of Physics and by gifts from friends of the program. Local broadcast is made possible by Pfizer Incorporated. <laughs>